I can imagine you are also hoping <laughs> yeah. that children are going to be returning to the classroom. How's homeschooling uh, going in your house? Uh, well, it's a, it's a challenge, as it is for everyone, but I'm very lucky. My, my son and my daughter, as, as I think you know, um, are facing GCSEs and A-levels this year. Um, but they're both at, uh, at great comprehensive schools, which are uh, doing a, a fantastic job in making sure that there is remote learning to, to help them. Um, but of course, we all want to make sure, uh, don't we, that children are back in the classroom at the earliest possible opportunity. So, I mean, your, your children are similar age to our children as well. And of course, that means they are pretty self-sufficient when it comes to their schooling because they're teenage, teenagers. But they are missing all their friends. They're missing the, the sort of the, the need to be surrounded by the classmates and all the extra activities that they do as well. And then, of course, we've got the junior and primary school children who are desperately struggling because it's a very, very different uh, proposition for their parents. What can you explain to them this morning about this date, the 8th of, Mar 8th of March, mm. that Boris Johnson uh, put out there yesterday? Will that be all schools? Is that primary schools? How firm a hope is that? Is that des definitely going to happen? Is that going to shift in some way? All very good points. We want to make sure that schools can return on the 8th of March. That's the target date. Uh, we want as many children back in the classroom as possible. But we'll be working uh, between now and then with head teachers. And uh, I know that you had some uh, fantastic representatives of the education sector on just before I came on uh, to make sure that um, uh, people can return in as safe a way as possible. And you're also right that uh, uh, while it's important that those, uh, those children uh, like mine who are facing their exams this year get support. It's also the case, of course, that for children um, in the very earliest years, um, uh, remote learning is a much, you know, it's a very different proposition. And uh, the sooner we can get uh, children back into the classroom and benefiting from outstanding teaching, the better. Michael Gove, why don't we vaccinate the teachers? in order just to boost the confidence of the staff. I mean, you know, even with the best will in the world and social distancing and masks in corridors, those teachers at comprehensive schools are standing up every day in front of huge groups of potentially infectious people. Yes, you're, you're, well, again, uh, as we just heard from uh, the uh, gentleman from the Association of School and College Leaders, it would be great to be able to vaccinate uh, more and more people um, in the classroom and on the front line. Uh, we proceed when we're prioritising people for vaccines on the basis of, um, you know, top scientific advice um, about uh, who should be vaccinated first. And as you're just showing now, uh, there are a list of uh, those who are most vulnerable and we want to make sure that they're protected. And of course, it will be the case as we uh, proceed through that, uh, uh, that nine uh, uh, category list. Uh, that there will be uh, a number of people, uh, teachers and other support Can staff you prioritise teachers once you've vaccinated the most vulnerable, the, the elderly, by mid-February? Can yeah, you tell... Yeah, Labour are saying, aren't they, February half-term, which is mid-February, would that be a good point to say, do you know what, from the 15th of February, the middle of, of that half-term, we're going to start prioritising teachers? I think that we need to make sure that we do that with the, uh, the benefit of the best scientific advice, because, again, what we want to do overall is to make sure that we uh, uh, help those who are most at risk, that we also reduce the pressure on the NHS so that it's there for all of us when we need it. But, of course, we also want to make sure that teachers and others can have confidence as well. Um, and that's why we need to make sure that uh, uh, as we review who should be vaccinated and when, we're doing so with the benefit of the advice of the of the doctors who are in the best position to keep us all safe. Well, talking of doctors, um, we have spoken to a doctor this morning about what's gone wrong in the UK when it comes to the death toll. Um, I have to say, I think many, many people have found this week particularly bleak when we passed the 100,000 deaths milestone. Um, it, it was a sinking feeling, wasn't it? It was absolutely desperate. And then when we saw the Prime Minister stand up at the press conference and say, well, the government's done everything it possibly could, a lot of people found that a disingenuous thing to say. And, in fact, when Ben put that question to Dr Rachel Clark, palliative care doctor, who's right at the front line, she had something stronger to say. Have a listen. When you hear Boris Johnson say, we've done everything we can, how does that make you and your colleagues feel? I was absolutely sickened when I heard him say that because it was patently and obviously a lie. 
he didn't lock down promptly. He didn't close our borders. He didn't protect our care homes. He he threw vulnerable people to the wolves in care homes. He didn't do any of the things first time round that could have helped. And worse, he repeated the same mistake second time round. And all of us as doctors, we're used to making difficult decisions and having to look people in the eye and say, I'm sorry, I have to tell you your loved one is dying. We can't shirk that. That's leadership. That's being tough and doing a good job. Boris Johnson stands up in front of the cameras and he doesn't even have the decency to brush his hair and he looks the country in the eye and he doesn't tell the truth. He tells us what he thinks we want to hear, what's popular instead of what's right. And I can't forgive him for that because that failure of character is having a cost of tens of thousands of lives and we are seeing these people die. Devastating to hear an NHS doctor who knows what's happening day to day to accuse the Prime Minister of lying when he says that the government's done everything it could. Yes, well, I'm uh, full of admiration and uh, and thanks for those on the front line for for Rachel and for other doctors for doing what they're doing at the moment. Um, You know, they are heroes and heroines. And uh, as we know from uh, uh, reporting from the front line, including um, on GMB, um, it is a a harrowing and an extremely uh, difficult task and one that they're they're, they're carrying out with, um, you know, amazing... To address her point directly, it is not true, is it? That's her fundamental point. It is not true that the government did everything it could. There was an issue with testing. The government did not throw a protective ring around care homes. A third of that devastating death toll is people who died in care homes. We have been catastrophically late to quarantine and border controls. We have not had a a system of contact tracing that has worked. I mean, we have made so many mistakes, or when we've introduced things, we've introduced them so late that it simply doesn't wash that we did everything we could. Well, again, you were laying out quite rightly um, a number of uh, different areas because of the response to the pandemic requiring action in lots of different areas. Um, And I think I have and other ministers have uh, said um, on this programme and on others uh, that there are uh, lessons to be learned and, and we are learning them in real time about how to improve um, our response. What would um, you I would have say, changed, Mr Gove? What would you have changed early on? Um, well, I would say that um, if we look at other countries as well, you know, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that um, uh, our death toll is anything other than heartrending. but if you look at other countries as well, we've learned from them, different countries have taken different approaches in different ways. Uh, we've all faced a... Uh, a new virus which has operated in an horrendous way. Can you talk um, about any, have... Mr Gove, can you talk about any specifics that you've learned? One of the things that uh, Dr Clark also brought up was the fact that recently she has seen three generations of the same family come in and all suffer from COVID and all die because they mixed at Christmas, which was advice from the Prime Minister that we could mix at Christmas, even though, of course... The virus didn't get the memo to have the day off. She has seen three generations of the same family die because of a policy that your government and the Prime Minister allowed to go ahead. What's your reaction to that? Is that something you realise now... Was a mistake. ..was a mistake? Well, uh, again, uh, 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 words can't convey uh, how sad any of us would feel about um, the deaths of of three members of a family. Yeah, was it a mistake? Well, again, uh, I think that, you know, my approach has been to concentrate on doing better every day in those things um, where uh, where we can improve. Yes, do you see that as a mistake now? No, well, I'd say that in due course, we'll have an opportunity to look back um, and to review all of the decisions that... Mr Gove, um, we're in the second wave now, which is even more devastating than the first wave. Many people would say the time to have looked back would have been between the first wave and the second wave. For you to be turning around and saying, we're going to have time to look back down the line, what happens if we have a third wave and we're still not deciding that we're going to look back and admit that there were mistakes made and we have to learn from them? I think what the British public want to hear is you standing up and being honest and saying, we've made some mistakes, these are mistakes that we will rectify and we won't allow happen again. If you're saying you're going to look at this down the line, these mistakes are going to keep happening. 
Well, I think it is the case that we've uh, improved our response in a number of areas. So um, the number of people who are being tested has uh, risen dramatically. Contact tracing has improved. Uh, the vaccine rollout, uh, which uh, uh, GMB has been so fantastic in supporting, um, uh, has made sure that um, uh, we vaccinate more people than uh, any other European country. Uh, these are all areas where uh, the, the government and those whom we work with have been learning in real time um, about how to improve. But uh, I, I think there's a difference between, a perfectly legitimate difference between um, uh, uh, public debate and critique and the job of government in making sure that we improve in each of these individual areas. And, and I'm uh, always happy to look at any individual uh, aspect of our response um, and to consider how uh, we can improve it uh, that's part of government's job. Uh, before we let you go, Mr Gove, um, can you tell us your opinion here on the uh, row over vaccine supply? The EU um, is absolutely furious that AstraZeneca doesn't appear to be able to uh, deliver what they promised. Is there any chance that we, in the UK, might lose out on vaccine because the EU hasn't got enough? No, the, the um, programme of vaccination um, has been uh, agreed and assured um, and uh, the supplies were uh, fixed some time ago um, and we will make sure that uh, the vaccine programme proceeds exactly as planned. Uh, but of course it is the case that uh, we'll want to uh, talk to and talk with our friends in Europe to see uh, how we can help. But the really important thing is making sure that our own vaccination programme uh, proceeds precisely as planned. Because the vaccination programme is one of the great successes. We certainly don't want to be making any mistakes there. Michael Gove, we have to let you go. <clears throat> Not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Very frustrating when it comes to Christmas mixing because you have all of the adverts at the moment saying, look this patient in the eye and tell them you are not bending the rules. Look this patient in the eye and say that you're adhering to social distancing. But when we look the government ministers in the eye and say, is it a mistake? that we let people mix well, at Christmas. Well, we're going to look back and work this out down the line. I mean, you, we just want them to work it out now and be honest about it. I think we all would like to see some honesty from them. And when you've got someone like Dr Rachel Clark being really clear and concise about the pain and the anguish for mm. a family that loses three generations because they mixed at Christmas under government advice, when, as she said at the time, they were shouting from the rooftops to lock down, things were going to get far worse. And they didn't because, as she points out, it was because Boris Johnson told the great British public what they wanted to hear rather than what they needed Because he'd to said, of course, it would be inhuman to cancel Christmas. But then they allowed mixing, which is clearly, in the eyes of the doctors, led directly to people dying. Incredibly, incredibly frustrating.